something that is not in your schedule. Like we know, yes, one of the initial founders of Ethereum, yes, we know about Invictus Innovations and IOHK and Bitcoin Research Group, but did you know that he was gifted a giraffe by the South African president? Do you know that he regularly plays uh, football with an elephant? Do you know that he owns an amazing ranch in Colorado? And I have some advice from my personal island, true story, that I will be getting, praise the Lord, in like 10 years. And he had lots of great advice for me as to how to set it up. This man is just full of incredible information. I'm sure the next couple of minutes are going to be outstanding. Please put your hands together for Charles. Thank you so much. Now, I don't regularly play football with an elephant. I only did it once. How long do I have? Ten minutes? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll just wing it. Well, welcome to Davos. You guys having fun? You like being poked and prodded every time you go to a hotel? Long train rides, the Ubers take forever to get to you and it says one minute. Yeah, it's my first time here actually. I usually go to Semarit's, but uh, I tend to avoid Davos. But I said, all right, you know, WEF is important, I'll come. You know, Trump is here, why not? <laughs> and Greta too, depending on which side of the spectrum you are. Um, so, uh, so the topic of the speech is blockchain for social good. And it's actually a great topic, and it's something that's near and dear to my heart. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. You know, the point of this industry, at the core of it, is all about problem solving. You see, the reality is we live in a world where we have this complex global commercial system where all these people who really don't like each other have to get along for the good of their customers and the good of their products. For example, if you have a cell phone, you probably go from country to country. When you turn on the phone and it connects to a network, the odds are that the network that you're used to, because I have an American cell phone company, you probably have Swisscom or something, is different. So they have to have an agreement with whoever owns those towers and how the data is going to be shared. Uh, medical records are another example. The movement of money is another example. Basically, there's all these consortia, there's all these countries, and they have to somehow find a way to get along and agree on a common set of logic for our benefit as we travel and trade with each other and as we want some certainty that the travel and trade will be safe, fair, and equitable. Okay, so at the same time, the powers of globalization are dramatically changing the economies of many developing world countries. For example, we do a lot of work in Africa. and We have an office in Ethiopia. We talk a lot to the agricultural sector there, and these big Western companies are saying things like, we would love you to prove to us that you're conducting fair trade and that you're doing things in a sustainable way and you're using the right type of fertilizers and so forth. So how does a farmer who's not even internet connected and does everything on paper in a handshake prove that? They need new systems. So how this is traditionally solved back in the day was that some empire would win, like the British Empire or the American Empire. And then they would set the standards for the whole world, for better or for worse, usually in their own benefit. But we live in the 21st century and we'd rather not have another world war. We'd rather not have big empire telling us what to do. We'd like for power to be pushed to the edges. And therein lies a lot of social good that we can do because it turns out the very same technology that can be used to do things like tell you where your coffee is in your supply chain can also be used to help out refugees. There are millions of diaspora floating around the world. Syria gets into conflict or Sudan gets into conflict and they flee. And when they flee, they often flee with nothing just a few sentimental possessions, perhaps a passport, perhaps not, usually not, no assets. And then when peace comes, they return to the home country. And then when they come back, there's somebody living on their land who says, well, I stuck out the war, so I should have it. And guess what? There's no records anymore because they were destroyed by whatever conflict occurred. This is a reality millions of people suffer in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, so many places in the world. So. It turns out that the same things that can allow us to trace coffee can allow us to actually start talking about things in a more global way for those who live in the world. Concepts like self-sovereign identity, for example. The idea that you could own your own identity and all the metadata associated with that, including the property rights. Instead of having your local government contain the property ledger, you can create a backup on a system that your government does not control. So what does that mean? It means if everything goes to hell, you can take your property with you so that when reasonable times and reasonable people come back into power, those can 
actually be reinstated, or at the very least, we know who actually owns what or where. Similarly, we think about foreign aid. We think about tracking and tracing the flow of money. For example, there's many people in the world who would love to donate money to help people who are in a bad place in life. But one of the biggest problems is how do we know the money is actually going to do good for people? You don't. So how do you track that? How do you trace that? How do you make sure the money is actually going into the right hands? For example, we have hurricanes every year in the Caribbean. Islands get wiped out. Whole communities are destroyed in Puerto Rico and Haiti and many other places. And it takes usually billions of dollars to put these things back together. And year after year after year, we read the same reports in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Reuters, where those billions and billions of dollars, it turned out that pennies on the dollar ended up actually going to what people said they're going to do. And there's a lot of people now driving my box and Maseratis and other things living in Florida who squandered that money. So one of the great things is the very same things we talk about with Ethiopia and Georgia and other governments about tracking and tracing use of tax revenue can actually be used to track and trace donations that are done. So you have this global citizenship, this economic identity, self-sovereign identity, and then you can connect it to the property portfolio, you can connect it to reputation, and oh, and by the way, it's a payment system. So you can now directly pay people who are registered, and you can track and trace what they do with those funds. This is why compliance is actually a good thing for our industry, because the very same techniques and tools that can be used for banks and exchanges and financial institutions to get a better understanding of how to comply with AML and KYC can be repurposed to actually track and trace the use of funds when you donate funds to people. It's a powerful concept. Most of it's open source, and it's something that we can easily build and apply into these particular systems. Perhaps the most powerful thing about social good, and the thing I've personally witnessed, is the fact that capital historically tends to live in certain geographies. And that's no longer true with our ecosystem. Capital tended to live in London, and Zurich, and New York, and Silicon Valley, and Tokyo, these big centers that have trillions of collective dollars floating around. And if you want to get some of it, you have to live there. You have to have access to it. You have to have networks there. But all the time we see people with amazing business ideas all across the world. It can be in Bolivia with a cattle farm. It can be in South Africa and the townships and try to build some homes there at a very low cost with high returns. In many cases, these investments are significantly better than the investments you would get in these jurisdictions. So the key thing that our industry is bringing is it's creating one world market one global market for everybody together, and every single person has equal access to that marketplace, not just for payments, but also for credit, also for equity financing. Very soon, we're going to have this thing called the security token revolution. Many people in this room are going to be participants of that. It's not just about making securities better and getting cross-border settlement and making it easier to communicate with your investors and creating liquidity for SMEs. It's also about saying we can build a global stock market, a global VC for the poorest people in the world who need the capital the most to upgrade their countries and pair that with that self-sovereign identity and pair that with the tracking and traceability and the ability to know that people are spending money correctly. You can create some of the safest, most auditable investments in the world for the poorest people in the world. It's a pretty amazing concept, and this is the future that we're marching our way towards in the next 10 to 20 years. So I think this invention perhaps is the best invention in history for the poorest and the least amongst us. A final point to mention, what this is all about, our movement, has always been about killing the middlemen, the middlemen of necessity. It's okay to have middlemen when they add value, when you hire somebody to make the transaction better or safer, more secure, make you more money. Everybody has an agent, right? But the middlemen of necessity are the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the Facebooks of the world, and they always do the same thing. They take over a marketplace, and then they get to decide the rules, and the rules always favor them. So if we get rid of the middlemen, what it means is there's more money for the edges, and those edges will now include the three billion poorest amongst us. So thank you all for coming. I know it's a brief speech, but I'm really excited about the future, and I hope we can build it together. Cheers.